I played with the wild ones as a child. I remember that as clear as yesterday. Lending words and trading for toys, swapping names and titles, little epithets to take home to mom. Sometimes, she'd smack my hands and tell me not to say their names past 8 o'clock. Other times, she'd ask if I brought anything good home. A bronze whistle, a Nintendo DS, a whole box of cookies, unopened, a straw doll with no face. Mom was a lot of things, and yes, a liar was one of them. For every truth she told me, whether about fairies, how light switches worked, or where babies came from, there was a lie not long after. My father was a prince who left her penniless. I'd had a twin stolen by the Fae. Mom was the President of the United States. I'd gotten pretty good at discerning her truths from lies by the time I turned 11. 11 was an important year in my life. Because that's when the US government also caught up with enough of my mother's lies. This landed her in jail for more decades than I'd be able to wait out. Forgery, impersonation, identity theft, something like that. The kind of stuff that's hard for a child to understand. What I did understand, was that I was about to leave my cozy home on the outskirts of a quaint town in upstate Maine, for a shabby apartment in the suburbs of New York City, with my father, who was, as I guessed, not a prince. He also hadn't known I'd existed. Thought I was another lie mom told, until he got a phone from the police saying his daughter needed a home. He took me in, though he treated me more like a feral cat than a daughter. Kind. Gentle. Afraid. My childhood passed as a blur of mundane experiences and uninspired inspiration, that led me to my college years. That. That's kinda where I'm picking up. Something about returning to a wooded area stirred something at the base of my memory. Events from my childhood I'd blocked out, for want of a better phrase. It's hard, at first, to explain why I might have tried to forget so many experiences of the Fae, when I was younger, especially when the early days, those stupid sunny memories, were so wild and free. But when I moved to the city, my recollection of dealing with fairies gets blurry. Not just because there's something off about urban magic, but because that's when people started getting hurt. People like William. My first few nights away at school were a mess of late nights and nightmare, of paranoia and stress. I'd been so excited to leave the urban center of New York City, for a more nature-infused college experience, and here I was, sweating every night awake in bed. I tried counseling, but scratched the idea, when I realized that there was only a handful of ways talking about magic to a therapist was gonna end. None good. It was on the third meeting of my creative writing course that the TA introduced the concept of writing as a form of therapy into my head. Putting down potentially traumatic memories down on paper as a way to help you cope with them. And some solid coping method sounded about right for the tangle of emotions I was feeling about William. Shame for having forgotten him. Guilt because I could have stopped what happened to him. Anxiety that what happened to him might happen to me. William. I'd been 13 when we'd met. He was 12 and brave enough to ask me to my own 8th grade formal. I was taller and couldn't get over how dumb we looked on the dance floor. We drank fruit punch mixed with Sprite and ate brownies, and then awkwardly tried to kiss before our parents took us home. Somehow we kept our pre fling going through my freshman year. A whole year together, and somehow I'd forgotten him. First kisses, first dates, him picking me up at school. William had gotten taller and schools in New York are huge compared to Maine, so everyone just assumed he was a high schooler like me. No one could single him out as a middle schooler, amidst the concrete jungle of an urban school. It was nothing like my old country school. Part of me missed the smell of pines, the ancient trees that could hide anything. No women in green hid behind the well-groomed trees in city parks. There were no children with adult faces, lurking amid mushrooms, in a ring because there weren't fairy rings in the city. There weren't fairies in the city. There couldn't be fairies in the city. I didn't think about the fairies as I slipped through those pre years, but I wouldn't be the one to pay for this lapse in judgment. The night after William's 8th grade formal reminded me. Reminded me that things existed in the world that often go unseen. The things your brain deletes out, when you move your eyes from one familiar thing to the next. I almost hadn't gone to the dance cause William had bragged to his friends that he was inviting a high schooler, and that bothered me at 14. But then he'd made it up to me by buying me giant silver hoop earrings from Claire's, and the date was on. Because my dad didn't know anything about raising teenagers, he let us walk home from the dance. He could have picked us up, but I convinced him not to. William's parents knew he was sleeping over at my place, on the couch, in the living room. No funny business, so we could stay out as late as we wanted. Do whatever we wanted. Be the children of the earth we were born to be. So we ended up at the 24-hour Denny's, a truly liminal place. 
I didn't usually go out late, not since moving in with my dad, and William was never out past 10 like this. We arrived to find the place nearly deserted. Oh, that it had been. Hello? I'd called, always that brave one. I think they're closed, William whispered, as he worried he'd bother the people, who didn't appear to be there. We should just. I want my pancakes. Come on, let's just find a seat. Sometimes when it's late, they let you do that. My voice held a conviction that, at 14, felt warranted. I escorted us both over to a table with a good view of the front of house and the kitchen, just in case. We sat in awkward silence, him checking his phone conspicuously, and me looking through the menu, certain that someone would check in on us. And, we should just. Again, I cut him off. I'm gonna go pee. If a waiter comes while I'm gone, order three pancakes with chocolate chips, a la carte. Fine, but if she's not here by the time you get back, we're leaving. His voice had a distinct pout to it, so I compromised, agreeing on this one, small give. However, as I walked to the bathroom, I passed a bored woman with pink hair, bustling past me, towards our table. I glanced over my shoulder and grinned as I saw her stop at our table. Hi, welcome to Denny's, can I take your order? Uh, yeah, he said. I'll have a stack of three chocolate chip pancakes. I left William to place the order, not realizing just how doomed he already was. No, instead I returned, shaking water from my fingers and plopped myself across from him, sipping at the water the waitress had left. So, I said, voice a smug chirp. Did she come? He shot me a glare, watching me nonchalantly sip at my water, and said nothing. If I could go back in time and redo the evening, I'd have stayed at the table. I'd have minded my manners. But I'd almost entirely lost touch with my childhood, and I'd yet to realize that, though the whimsy of the green was lost in urban decay, the magic was far from muted. There was malice here, and deep down inside, I'd felt it. I felt it in the flickery fluorescence, in the carpet that didn't properly repeat its pattern, in the lack of clatter and chatter elsewhere in the kitchen. I ignored it, having too often ignored the anxiety I felt at places in between, and instead forced a conversation about Pokemon. If William felt anything amiss, he suppressed any innate gut feeling, that told him he'd already screwed up. Badly. We must have been engrossed in our conversation, because neither of us realized that it had been a while, since we'd ordered until the clock chimed. I'm hungry, William said, noting the rings of the clock, oddly formal for a Denny's. Thought you'd wanted to skip getting food. I prodded the ice cubes around my cup, chasing them with a straw. We would have eaten already by now, if we'd gone straight home. He stood up, craning his neck over the booths, just short enough for an adult to look over, but just tall enough to block a child's view. I'm gonna. I guess I'm gonna check the kitchen. I snorted, but didn't stop him, cause I was also hungry, and cause I wanted to call him out for ordering me a stack, instead of pancakes a la carte. The stack came with bacon and I'd been pretending to go vegetarian that year. He left the table and I stayed. I stayed and chased ice cubes. I stayed and listened as he chased her down and demanded back an order he'd already given her. Hey, excuse me hey. That's our food. Pardon me, sir. That's my meal. We've been waiting for ages, and that's the exact thing I ordered. At this, I hear the slide of plates. The clink of cheap ceramic plates. There's the sound of grunting, the woman says hey. And then there's a crash. Oh my god. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. I didn't I'm sorry. Look what you've done. The plates are broken, the food's on the ground, my clothes are ruined. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me get that, let me. I'll pick it up. Just give me a hand. Sure, yeah. You need a broom or something? I'll get whatever need. You'll give me whatever I need? Yeah, anything. Between my phone and my ice cubes, I didn't notice that the restaurant had gone quiet. I didn't realize until a waiter, an older man with heavy eyebrows, arrived at my table and asked how long I'd been there and if I was alone. He apologized for making me wait so long. They were switching out the staff and back, from evening to overnight, and no one had heard the door open. I looked up at his face, illuminated in the even glow of the yellow bulbs above. Someone already took our order. The words hadn't felt right in my mouth, as I said them, and my hands felt heavy at the ends of my wrists. William went to get it. There are some things, words, meals, gifts, that you don't get back once you've offered. I never saw William again.